does machine learning really improve security? Does it? As a cybersecurity strategist, I'm often asked, um, how do we know that machine learning is really effective? How do we know whether this particular solution is the real solution or is it just another AI-powered snake oil? I'm Kavya Perlman. I am the cybersecurity strategist for Wallarm. Wallarm is, yes, an AI-powered API security solution that plugs it right into your CI CD pipeline, provides you know, API security, cloud native security, all the solutions. Besides that, I'm also the founder of XR Safety Initiative. It's a nonprofit that's dedicated to helping build safe, immersive environments. And it's that quest. And besides all of that, I really am a student, a learner of all these emerging technologies. My goal is to try to find what's the impact of these emerging technologies on cybersecurity and vice versa. And that's the quest that took me to Wallarm. And today, I'm going to try to, I mean, this talk is 50 minutes. That's a lot. So I've tried to divide this into sort of three sections. We'll talk about that. So you're trying to divide this into like three sort of main sections, which you'll notice as the talk evolves. But first, for the next 40 to 50 minutes, first we'll talk about the good, bad, and the ugly that machine learning brings with it. Then we'll go talk about the evolution of attack detection, how the attack detection, the real-time cyber attack detection has evolved, but have we adopted it? And then finally, I'm going to present to you this use case that I've been closely studying and I've had the opportunity to because of Wallarm's involvement and my involvement with Wallarm. So I'm going to present that to you. Somebody, and to Bring this together, my fear had been like, oh, is it like a vendor talk or a pitchy? But if you look me up, this is one thing that you can understand. I can only talk about Wallarm accurately. I couldn't talk about other products. And that's why I'm going to use this, lean on this use case to present my hypothesis. So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which today is used as like this umbrella term um, for a computer program that does something smart. In other words, machine learning is AI, but AI is not machine learning. Machine learning relies on mathematical models derived from analyzing patterns in various data sets. And I'm going over it, and some of you may be thinking, oh, I kind of know that, but this is a talk dedicated to every sort of audience. So bear with me if you already know what machine learning is all about. So application of machine learning, as most people know, spans across many, many domains. We wake up. One of the first thing I ask, hey Siri, what's the temperature in San Francisco? So I know what to wear when I go out. And that is an algorithm utilizing machine learning to tell us what could be the potential route. All these calculations are happening in the background with those data sets. As early as 2013, pioneers like Silence, Darktrace, and some startups like Wallarm have released these AI-based cybersecurity products. And since then, the number of products have increased. Today, 60% of the security solutions include some flavor of machine learning or AI-powered technology. If you don't believe me, come to RSA. So, 
let's first look at how cyber defenders are using machine learning. They're using it for attack detection. Machine learning algorithm can be implemented in applications to identify and respond to cyber attacks before they take effect. And this is usually achieved by a predictive model developed by analyzing big data sets. So back when I graduated, I was a security operations center analyst. And at any given day, I would have about 50 tabs open trying to look at the SIM logs, trying to analyze what alerts are coming from AT&T thing. And it was just a crazy idea that we were doing this. Well, now we are moving towards a direction that all the work that people like myself had done has created this sort of predictive model that is ingested into these algorithms to make our lives easier. So analyzing it sort of faster, incident response. So the models, training data sets, it's typically made of these things, the things that we have already identified or recorded, like IOCs, indicators of compromise. Machine learning can do anomaly detection, including incident response, monitoring. Machine learning can be used to automate exactly what I used to do uh, at Allstate Insurance, just like plugging in these things and trying to figure out that needle in the haystack. And now, and it was almost like a needle in the needle stack. But this is where machine learning is good, is to find that needle in the needle stack, its accuracy. Risk analysis. And now this refers to the quantitative aspect. And as a cybersecurity strategist, it's really, really difficult. We rely on qualitative recommendations. And this is where people like myself, we lean on this machine learning aspects because this technology can allow us to gain exposure into network, into where exactly my crown jewels are located. PCI assets, and then we can accurately determine quantitatively the risk score, and that's very helpful. So using this machine learning is really advantageous in the sense that these scores will not be based on just like some strategist analysis. It's based on actual data sets. Now, it'd be foolish to think that only the good guys are using machine learning. Of course, the attackers, the malicious actors, they're also using these tools to make their exploits better, to make their attacks more intelligent. Now, it's especially true when it's so easy to use these open source models such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and it's all evolving, so if I'm a bad guy, why wouldn't I make use of it? It makes my attacks better. So let's look at how they could potentially be using it, and then we'll look at like, what's really the, should we be really concerned about it? So bypassing protection. Machine learning can be used to gain unauthorized access. You guys must have heard of like the robots trying to trick the CAPTCHA. That's machine learning trying to offensively orchestrate the offensive attacks. So with the machines being capable of identifying these objects and images, now they can be trained to bypass CAPTCHA. It's not that hard. So you know you're checking that box with the are you human? That is trickable with machine learning. Now, we need to utilize these neural networks you know, to sort of combat. But before we do that, we need to understand them as well. And all these password guessing. So I've mentioned a few things here, but password guessing. Remember rain rainbow tables that we maintained to try to like analyze, do the directory attacks, well, with machine learning, we have all of these advantages to do this faster and more accurately because it can synthesize more and more data sets. So obviously, you can weaponize password guessing and make it better. So exploitation of an attacker would find some of these issues inside the system 
and break it, they will do two things. First, they'll use these algorithms to try to check for what is known. The second thing, they could try to fuzz things, send it like, you know, uh, use fuzzy algorithms, send it uh, malicious uh, code and try to trick your algorithm. And this first approach is very simple. It's like following the checklist. Can I, like if I'm trying to find uh, vulnerability, can this be hacked, can this be hacked? Okay, done. But the second one is where things get interesting. And basically the idea is the attack tool will try to generate some kind of unusual behavior. Exactly what we do with fuzzing. Like putting some kind of a data into the request field to cause some kind of abnormal response. And this is where neural networks really shine. Artificial intelligence trained by already discovered payloads for existing vulnerabilities, they can now suggest new payloads that you can send to the target device, target systems, and then issue, and they can do that with better probability. We got our first glimpse to this AI-powered attacks, what would look like, I don't know if anybody remembers, I think it was 2016, DARPA's Cyber Grand Challenge. That was the world's first all machine cyber hacking tournament. Yeah, happened in 2016. And that contest proved that it was now possible to fully automate pract practical cybersecurity exploits like exploit generation, attack launches, patch generation processes. And we can pinpoint this event to as a beginning of this new era. Like now we have AI spinning up cyber attacks and causing offensive strikes. So at the exploitation phase, this AI can help to adapt and exploit for a particular environment faster than any human being can. So yes, we should care about these things. Now, multiple studies have been carried out how machine learning can leverage to gain unauthorized access to the systems. We talked about password guessing. Examples include password GAN. I don't know if anybody knows, but it can sort of generate these high quality password guesses by using what you call is generative adversarial networks. And then real passwords that are previously leaked are also ingested into it to try to make things more effective. Some studies actually focus on machine learning to generate password from real time, like you know, brute force attacks, all of these things, uh, stuff from the dark web. That's what is used to successfully gain these unauthorized access. Uh, data analysis of the compromised data. So imagine, Back in the days, like, okay, you have sort of successfully gotten a foothold and now you're trying to exfiltrate the data. You gotta go through some of these files or whatnot. You don't have to anymore because the machine learning algorithms can be trained to literally analyze and figure out what data is really valuable to exfiltrate. So I don't have to do an entire dump of whatever is the compromised data. I can simply target PII I can target, let's say, EEG, EKG data if I am in a sort of HIPAA type environment. And uh, whatever are the crown jewels? Um, that's what we can do with machine learning. But sh so should we worry about though? Should we worry about these scenarios playing out in the wild? And then what should we do to prepare for it? Let's take a look. According to the research report, released by International Cybersecurity Congress, compromised data analysis bypassing protection and prevention is what we see as prominently weaponized. So the point is, yes, those bad things are coming for us and they're being weaponized using machine learning and artificial intelligence, but we should focus on the attack detection, whatever is in our control. So, Detection of these malicious requests or attacks is a key factor 
in efficiency, in effectiveness, or most of the security solution. How accurately, how effectively we're detecting that. Post-analysis and pre-analysis, these type of solutions can still like, you know, it doesn't quite, it doesn't have to be so super accurate, but when it comes to the real time analysis, this is a make and break situation. So other methods of analysis, which include pre-release and the post analysis, they're a little bit more tolerant to the issue of performance, right? And they are a little bit more tolerant for this high false positive rates that we talk about. But when we talk about this real time detection, these solution need real time, more accurate, high performance solutions, high performance things. So other solutions like this post analysis pr uh, protection, Yes, they can benefit from machine learning, but I'm going to focus on what is really, really crucial to understand and apply is the real-time detection using machine learning. So let's start by looking at the oldest method and the most common approach, which is the signature-based, rule-based detection. We use it, use, we do it via regular expressions. Although this approach has number of drawbacks, but it is widely used. It is the most adopted solution by a lot of the vendors. In this traditional approach, this analysis is based on sequential checks of regular expressions, each of which represents single detection rule, a signature. A good example of regular base expression is open source core rule set. Christian Filoni is sitting right amongst us, and he knows that this is a traditional solution which is really effective in understanding and combating things that we already know. And that's why, and also it's easy to implement too, the periodic updates, those are effective. Some commercial products actually sell you these data sets too. And there is benefits. Easy to implement, you can deploy fast virtual patches anytime, and then you have this amazing community that I've had the opportunity to meet, uh, you know, trying to make things better. Um, clearly, it's like the most wide, widespread and widely used approach for detection method. With all its popularity, this legacy detection approach has a number of challenges. First of all, Hard to maintain, create, manage, or scale these rules. Because more we know, larger this set is getting. Another disadvantage is sort of data normalization, which is involved, which is pretty much like a manual process. User needs to configure a set of parser, a JSON, an XML, a Base64 for each of the data field for every API method of the application. And without this manual configuration, the encoded parameters that are used within the attack, they remain obscured. And they cannot be inspected without, without the, by the detection system. Second, regular expression. Regular expressions are great, but are you going to put a regular expression in the line of a single point of failure, where your CPU could go, I must process this expression or I won't let you proceed. That's the disadvantage is using regular expression because fundamentally this sort of, you know, property of this linguistic theory, the principle of regular grammar, that kind of comes into play. It's very restrictive and we'll talk about that regular grammar principle in a little bit. But regular expressions are also easy to bypass. And that's why they have a high, you know, most of these solutions have a high rate of false negatives too. There are a lot of these well-known obfuscation techniques that you can pretty much Google and learn about. So, or you could add like a little additional character to break the, you know, break the rule, but not affect the logic of your, you know, payload, malicious payload. So needless to say, 
This traditional method is implemented widely, but perhaps there is something better that we could do. And here I have just, you know, the purple dot really just says what is covered. So simple true negatives, that's what is covered. And some of the simple encoded API call true negatives, those are covered. But there is these empty circles that demonstrate to you things that are not very impactful and effective with this traditional approach. Before I move on to tokenizers, I want to just go into a little bit of this grammar focused approach. So in linguistic and language theory, grammar is defined as a set of rules or production rules which when applied to strings define the language. Anybody heard of American linguist Noam Chomsky? Wonderful. You guys are better than me. <laughs> I grew up in India, though. This was. <laughs> so Noam Chomsky has defined four categories of formal grammars as the containment hierarchy named after him, of course, the Chomsky hierarchy. And they span from type 0 to type 3. Type 0, free or unrestricted grammar. Type 1, context-sensitive grammar. Type 2, context-free grammars. Type 3, regular grammars. And this is the grammar that is like most restrictive and most limited in its expressive power. Now we know that regular expression generate high levels of false positive. This drawback is the fundamental property of the linguistic theory principle of the regular grammar as described in the Chomsky hierarchy. Since the regular expression can only cover regular grammar, more complex grammar rules within the application context are not covered. Examples of these more complex grammar including XSS, XQL injections, and other well-known attack types that are based on sort of recursive innumerable grammars. So according to Gen 1 detection, requests that you see in purple are bad, but they are not flagged as bad. Requests that you see in green get flagged as bad, but they are not. So second generation that uses tokenizer. The second generation methodology also of course, tokenizers, was developed to combat these two or those primary drawbacks, the problems that we have with Gen 1 detection logic, which is performance, accuracy, and this reducing these false positives and false negatives. This, uh, this approach literally, it circumvents both of these problems that we face, face with performance and accuracy. Open source libraries like libinjection, Lib detection. These are good examples of tokenizer's approach. The difference between the two libraries that the lib detection supports grammar extension by adding new lexical BNF grammar uh, descriptions. Another well-known project in this space is Langsec. The library not only parses the data, but also builds data flows across number of data representation layers. This module is also popular with a lot of the runtime application self-protection products, RASP. You guys probably heard of it. And this approach, of course, comes with a lot of benefits. We reduce the false positive rates and we lower the false negative rates in case of you know, regular expressions. Of course, improve performance all the way up to 10 times faster than PCRE-based detection. Now, while a great improvement on legacy first generation, but there's still some problems. You know, The main being this data normalization. So tokenizers, like there are a new page in this evolution of string processing library with better accuracy, better speed, but with the same general architecture. Data encoding like JSON, XML, Base64, they still require that user configuration. Like you have to configure each single format to each endpoint to discover the attacks. And so we have now covered you know, the definition, and we go back to the Chomsky theory, the defi defining principle of the second generation attack is to apply specific parser 
to each of the grammar, SQL, HTML, J JavaScript, etc. instead of using this universal regular expression engine like PCRE. Uh, the parser for a specific grammar, the SQL, now it can work much faster than the universal regex, uh, regular expression engine. Moreover, now this parser will also cover a real SQL grammar much closer than possible by the regex. Now this is the second generation of attack detection yet. Within the library, each parser state, it's called context, allows us to cover only so much of the surface. And the flip side of this capability is that the simplest way to bypass these things, these tokenizers, is to by finding these uncovered contacts. So then we move on to machine learning. The attack detection logic itself is always based on some kind of representation of this original grammar that we talked about. This original grammar, that is relevant to the attack type. For example, SQL grammar covers SQL injections. HTML and JavaScript grammar together covers XSS. LDAP protocol grammar covers LDAP injections and so on and so forth. Each new generation of this attack detection logic covers some real grammar with better accuracy, reduces the number of blind spots that you have in these syntax variants like false negatives, AKA the bypasses. And then it lowers this over coverage, which is the false positives. Now given the similarities, why is it so hard to just implement exactly the same grammar in the detection logic as it is in the protected system? The answer is very simple. The detection logic doesn't know about the environment of each of these systems the APIs are different. Even in the case of RASP and other variants, a host-based IPS or IDS solution where you have more visibility into the application context, the detection logic is literally blind to most of the parameters of a database to use exactly the same SQL grammar. File systems to protect the path traversal, the operating system, and many other issues. So to address this deficiency, we definitely need a better approach. And that's when we get into machine learning. This is the third generation of detection logic. The innovation of this third, detection, third generation is literally to apply machine learning techniques to bring the detection grammar as close as possible to the SQL to the real SQL HTML JS grammar of the protected system. This detection logic should be able to approximate a Turing machine to cover recursively innumerable grammars. Now this task of creating adaptable Turing machine, it was literally unsolvable until 2010, when the first researchers of neural Turing machines that were published. So in practice, and this is like simply, you can use any kind of machine learning model and still get better results than Gen 1 and Gen 2, depending on the application of it. And we'll talk about that. There are, of course, tremendous amount of benefits. The machine learning approach provides this unique ability to approximate all this grammar and gives you not just like blacklisted grammar like SQL, HTML, but the whitelisted grammars. For example, it's now possible to train the detection logic to understand globally unique identifier formats and decline all the other inputs. Now with this new approach, the detection logic is closely linked to the logic of the protected system, the application logic. Now the detection logic is used is it's using the feedback from the application to now better able to tune itself. It's learning. And I'm reading this book from um, The Master Algorithm. And if you read this book, it's not really about the models of machine learning. What it tells you is 
the remarkable thing about machine learning is more you use it, more you allow it to sit in your system, it will inevitably get better. And that's what is remarkable about these things that you are allowing it to learn and develop this feedback loop, which is called reinforcement. So generally this reinforcement can be done like in few types, but application response behavioral analysis, which is more of a passive approach, scanning or fuzzing, trying to mess with the uh, application, more of an active approach, analyzing some logs, hooks or traps, all of this. Needless to say, third generation of logic, of course, it solves some really important key issues with accuracies, but there is still some challenges. One, it's really hard to visualize what we've implemented via machine learning. So this sort of rule obfuscation issue happens where we don't know what we applied where sometimes. Then there is the production traffic. So in order to train your algorithm, you really need live attack data. Specifically to cybersecurity, this is true. You cannot just rely on your test data and have the same outcome. You really need to have a live environment where you anticipate and allow the real attack data to train your machine learning algorithm. Now, combining all of these three generations of detection logic, we can now draw a new diagram. So this whole pink outline, that represents this third generation of detection that cover, covers all of the grammars, the type zero all the way to type three. So if you're able to allow just enough time and real life attack data sets to train this machine learning model, the third generation of detection helps with all of these previously faced challenges. It covers them all. Now, all of that is great. Attack detection have evolved and we're heading to self-training systems who cannot only detect but even prevent attack logic. But how do we know? Who is offering the ideal solution? Remember that 60% Gartner's number, 60% of the security vendors are offering AI powered solutions. And so in order to shed further light on these sort of indicators, I'm gonna share with you, with you a use case, the use case that I just talked about. I'm gonna grab some water before that. So how do we recognize the AI snake oil? But first, I want to point to this amazing quote by Steve Grant. Intelligence involves a great deal more than ability to follow just the rules. It's also the ability to make up the rules for oneself when they are needed or to learn new rules through trial and error. You guys know Steve Grant, right? All of you, author of creation, look him up. He was this genius British roboticist who wrote uh, a simulation video game and then eventually wrote the book Creation. So, okay, the main task of runtime application security What's the main task? It's really to protect modern applications and APIs. However, in this endeavor, the solutions are facing number of challenges. Number one, applications are different in structure and in content. Things, are, things that are harmful for one application could be really use for, useful for another application. An example would be if I'm a blogger who talks about cybersecurity issues, I could literally put a malicious payload in my blog, a malware. I think that's normal, but if you put a DAST or any kind of scanner, it would flag it as malicious. It was a funny thing that happened. I actually had a USB once at Arizona DevSecOps uh, conference 
and I literally handed it to the organizer and as soon as they plugged it in, they're like, whoa, you're trying to hack me. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, no, this is so uh, totally OK. <laughs> so that's a, that's a kind of a challenge that we face. We're living in these different environments. For some of us, this is so normal to carry around some of the signatures or the malware uh, you know, b patterns and some of the VMs that are like running malicious code. User behavior varies for both applications and the individual functions. For example, like several calls for the login may indicate somebody is trying to do credential stuffing, while the data layer queries per second may be normal function of a building like a correlation data set. Then um, the number of attacks keep growing. So are we going to continue to build this massive data sets and linearly try to just analyze what's going to happen? That's almost impossible. So this set of signatures keep growing. And even with these signatures, there's this nested protocols that are hidden. And then straightforward implementation of attack detection based on signature, it often results in false positives and negatives. This is why. And I would like to look it up and validate, but I have been told 60% of web application firewalls are literally sitting in monitor-only mode. At least. At the very minimum. And it's like, oh, it really just reminds me of that, you know, the, uh, the Star Wars where you see the data leaving the ship, but nobody does anything. It's monitor-only. That's the policy. So it's like, what's the point of it all? How do we get better? What do we do? And that's where WallArm, it relies on its AI engine to solve these challenges. Their approach is literally just three layers of uh, machine learning. Reconstructing the app business logic. Basically, what's the structure of the application? Does it have login? Does it have checkout? Does it have search function? Uh, learning the data formats in the parameters. What type of data is entered in a form? What parameters is to the API? Is it multi-part? Is it base64? Or is it just plain old text? Then learning the behavior patterns. What it, what it means is what the, the typical way the user uses the application. How frequently do they use different functions? This is an example of how API call is represented in Wallarm. Wallarm first parses the HTTP requests and determines what application business logic is represented by each of these requests. Once the traffic is parsed, then it applies this machine learning to syntactically analyze the application and identify the application endpoint. First up, the request feature profiling pre-calculation phase. That happens in the node. And then there is another check that happens in the cloud. So this calculation really happens inside this in-memory database and then follows same algorithm. The algorithm is called cluster. So they use clusterization techniques to establish that. The second stage of machine learning takes the results of the first stage and then current application profile as an input. And the result now can be visualized in this way. This AI engine uses another machine learning model, which is based on characters. And it's a combination of distributed functions. So statistical based approach allows Wallarm to analyze these data fields with one single run operation, in contrast to the regular expression base approach, which, you know, it requires you to reread operations in many cases. So the resulting n gram distribution values, now that are put into request object and in memory database, and that that is serving as an input to the next iteration, which is the attack detection. During this final stage of the request analysis, 
Wellarm applies a machine learning based algorithm to classify previously detected anomalies by attack types and now eliminating the false positives. Now these anomalies are identified by applying fuzzy search to a statistical character distribution model. And then these attack types are recognized by analyzing these current requests against the ML model of the application graph. It's important that these attack type recognition applies only to the abnormal requests. So the phase one, phase two is just as important. We're literally recursively eliminating more and more stuff that is bad. And that the attack classification can now be visualized in this following way. This means for example, the SQL related command in the legitimate control panel will not be detected. We call this process called the legal true negatives. The same example like the malicious payload in my blog. That's legal true negative. So bringing it all together, and this is like a thousand foot view, is what a Gen 3 AI power detection engine architecture looks like. Now let's keep in mind, this is really, really high level, and we have to look under the hood. The most differentiated part of this machine learning approach, as you can see, is this reinforcement learning. And you can apply this to your web application firewall detection. You can potentially use this approach for any kind of a real-time attack detection. Overall, it's unique feature to Wallarm to use this reinforce, you know, reinforce this machine learning by passive as well as active vulnerability scanning. So I have talked about all of this stuff a lot. Now I would like to just give you some of the key items when somebody says, hey, we are, we are AI powered and you can potentially use the machine learning models to detect attacks and get better and reduce false positives. This is the one thing that you must ask for is to look under the hood. You must ask for what is your algorithm really based on? How have you developed this technology? And as applications and attacks grow in sophistication, how these traditional methods are different than what you're doing. So that's why we need to look under the hood. So for those who are interested, the Gen 3 model that I talked about, the attack detection phase three, is actually literally available for you to play with. So this is the layer that actually reduces the number of false positives. I've had the privilege to look beyond it, but everybody can download this code, Walnet, and run with your own either live attack data set or just your you know, test data set and validate, does it actually reduce number of false positives? Then I would probably be interested in learning more about Wallarm. The second link, it's some real time, some real data sets so you could test. Um, you can either prepare your data sets however you like, or you could train the network, or you can use, test these models using the data sets that I provided. I know I covered a lot. So I'm just gonna recap with just few key takeaways as to how to recognize this snake oil. Automation is not equal to AI. Some people are really just going to tell you we're gonna make things faster. That does not mean that they are using multi layers of machine learning that is allowing you to use neural networks and whatnot. Don't fall for it. There is a lot of snake oil out there. Come to RSA. <laughs> Dig deeper on these machine learning models, just like I have. And full disclosure, I'm not a machine learning researcher. I am just a student in life who is interested in learning 
all sorts of religion by adopting them, all sorts of technology by exploring them, and just living it. And I think that's what we need to do when somebody offers you like this silver bullet, ask them, dig deeper, be curious. That's something that we should do. The very key point that we have to do before you recommend to your CTO or your CIO that that's the thing to do is test these solutions. I wouldn't be able to test it. You know who I asked help for? Michael. I was like, hey, you're a data scientist. Tell me what's going on here. Show me how it's done. And that's how I built this talk. And that's how I learned about, oh, OK, I can actually now get on the stage and talk about this thing because I kind of understand. Drew the parallels with the recursive grammar and whatnot. And that's exactly how you analyze technology. I didn't earlier talk about a little bit of my background, but you know, in 2016, during US presidential election, I was also doing third party security for Facebook. And that's when I learned this skill. I was analyzing all of types of small mom pop shop all the way to massive organizations. And when they wanted to come in and work with Facebook, we had to find the risk. What could go wrong? Every single time, we unleash the hackers, almost, on every single one of them to try to find the real deal. And that's what we got to do. We got to really look under the hood. So before you buy any of these AI powered, because you know what's critical? The live attack data, understanding your true environment. That's what's critical. So you should do a proof of concept. Let that algorithm sit in your environment, understand it, analyze it. And that's how you may be able to separate real solutions from the snake oil. And I'm at booth 19, in case you need more information on this, I'll be happy to discuss. We also have the chief product officer of Volarm, Stepin. he's there if you want to have a chat with him. I think he'd be better suited to explain more on this. I think this is almost literally as much as I have known uh, in terms of like strategy. How do I strategically adopt these solutions? How do I recommend to different companies? So if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to. Thank you for a nice talk, Javier. As a proponent of the first uh, generation and the signature-based web application firewall, oh, I'm a so bit in a tricky position to present my talk tomorrow after your talk. <laughs> so uh, still going to give it a try. Uh, you said you need to put uh, your solution in line to see the right traffic to learn about the attacks. How do you know it's an attack before you have learned? Isn't that the snake bites its tail? So how do you know it's an attack when you haven't trained it? Right. So there is three phases, right? There is the learning the behavioral analysis, how the application is working. That's the phase we are targeting. But in itself, any kind of a security solution is going to have its own detection engine. So for example, you will always guaranteed know all the OWASP top 10 stuff in any attack detection solution. You could write off the bad guarantee that it's going to look for that top 10, the known attack patterns. So it is certainly, so what you're asking is, oh, is it not going to use signatures to detect <laughs> that? Is that what you're asking? OK. Um, I wish I could say you got me there, but that's the unique feature is to go away from the signature. What it does use is rules, which is not PCRE based. It's not regex based. It's not analyzing it recursively until it processes it, it all. So that's the unique part of it is yes, it does have to rely on these existential rules, but they are not, you don't have to use these parsers to be able to do this detection. <laughs> so is it, is it uh, fair to say it's pattern based? 
Oh, is it fair to say it's pattern based rather than signature based? It is certainly not signature based. And I think that's a good question that I should ask Stepin and get you a better answer before I, okay. you know, not, I don't want to speak inaccurately. But I would imagine, so you are not using the tokenizers, you're separating these attack types that are well known and building this other set of libraries to ta train your machine learning models. So let me get you a better answer than I just say, oh yeah, it's pattern based. Because it looks like it's being classified and certain patterns indicate that it could be malware, you know. So, yeah, so, hmm. I, I, I wouldn't make that assessment mm -hmm. right okay. this minute, but yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks, yeah. Oh, if no, if nobody else is asking a I question, told you I won't how guess. do you handle a situations where you're facing B2B applications where the customer would love to have more traffic, but there's a serious lack of traffic and you still need to protect it? So you don't really have the base to learn. Right. And this is a business question, to be very honest, but I think if somebody asked my CEO and chief product officer, like, hey, how am I going to do this? Because I don't have much of traffic, like for a startup, that would be a good question. Like, hey, I don't have much of a malicious traffic, but I still want to be proactive. Then we would potentially, and this would be my job to potentially recommend some kind of a parallel. So nonprofits, for example, do they face nation state hacks and attacks? Probably not. So we could potentially use existing models of other businesses not to say data from the other businesses, because this detection logic is recursively getting better. And we're not taking data, we're taking the semantic data to improve this detection. So what I would advise is to use something that is similar to their business logic to get them started, and then let this sit in the environment to then build upon it. Hopefully that would what you're propose, proposing is super dangerous. But that is a huge privacy leak. <laughs> uh, it's it not be, my that, field of why, interest. No, but, I, I agree. And that uh, is my field of interest. Taking models and transferring them, uh, machine learning modeling, transferring a different environment is leaking information from the other organization, probably. So as an advocate of privacy and proponent of privacy, if I saw that happen, I would stop it right there or resign. That's, that's a given. But what I specifically mentioned, because I kind of, you know, this is a fear that could happen with machine learning models, is you could literally take an environment's data and apply it to another. We're taking semantic data, these grammar rules that we are building upon. It's knowledge, but not data sets. It's really just, and I, I understand why I can't convince you, but that's a different reason. Okay. And if there is one person in this room that I thought I would not be able to convince, that's Christian Filoni, because he does an amazing Gen 1 detection, and he you know, brings everybody together, runs this amazing community. So, hey, all my love to... Yeah. <laughs>